thanks everyone for being here um and i thanks for all the team for inviting me so i'm going to talk about uh, an exhibition that uh, i curated in 2019 um which was part of a much larger project uh, that had started in my 2014-17 postdoc when i first went to the philippines in 2015 and was supposed to continue on um unfortunately got cancelled over covid so we were taking the exhibition on uh well kind of back to and onwards to manila where it was developing uh, into a further exhibition which sadly got cancelled however it had it has continued on uh in a number of other smaller more kind of tactical projects uh which are continuing on the same theme the project so it was important for us that it wasn't just an exhibition just a singular output but part of a much larger um kind of temporal project uh which has been slightly paused by COVID, but is still ongoing again. Um, so my talk is only about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and then, yeah, I'm really looking forward to speak to everyone afterwards. Okay, so, oh yeah, and this, what I'm gonna be talking about is taken uh, from a, a chapter in Shireen Wharton's edited volume, along with Antonia Wolford and Timothy Carroll, Lineages and Advancements in Material Culture Studies. It's a great uh, book, I really recommend it. Um, with all our colleagues from uh, the material culture section here at UCL. Okay, so uh, I can't actually see what that says because of my screen, but curating the anthropological, I might say. So the museum has played a central role within the history and development of anthropology. As a discipline that has had, as George Stocking has recounted, the collection, preservation, exhibition, study, and interpretation of material objects, at its very core, the sacred site of the museum has acted as a critical pivot through which models of the anthropological subject have been encountered and engendered, and where understandings of the so-called ethnographic other have been material instantiated through the display and narration of these other's objects and bodies. It has not only brought the social and material world of our informants into visible reach, but created specific techniques specific ways of thinking about these people themselves. In this way, the changing conventions of collection and differing practices of exposition can be understood to disclose as much about our discipline as those set under its disciplinary gaze. The museum's vitrines not only containing, as Barbara Kirsch and Black Gimblet notably remarked, the quote, artifacts of our disciplines, end quote, but in themselves acting as quote, exhibits of those who make them. So a space of accumulation and acculturation of education and investigation, the museum is a space in which institutional paradigms are materially revealed and created a depository of objects and ideologies alike. So, for example, and quite classically, the teleological typological arrangement of ethnographic artifacts that Augustus Pitt Rivers famously formed in the 19th century has retrospectively been seen as a mode of display paralleling the evolutionary biologism of Darwin, a technique not only placing those from elsewhere into an ossified past, but containing an entrenched racial hierarchy with Caucasians, especially Victorian ones, at the top. On the other hand, Franz Boas's rejection of the technique of this technique as deceptive, due to its reliant on outward appearance rather than on imminent qualities, a rejection leading to his more contextual, pluralistic, dioramic presentations of tribal life, scenes often related to practices rather than objects, have themselves been argued here by Michael Burdon to have denied any sense of, quote, the individual as a cultural actor, end quote, creating a depiction of, quote, quasi-automata, acting mostly through habit and through imitation, end quote. Moreover, whilst containing a clear message of liberal relativism, they could also be seen to have contained created a context in which objects existed devoid of any history. And that's one in which the circumstance of these artifacts, often highly dubious, to say the least, acquisition, have been left entirely unaddressed. In a similar way, whilst the immersive environments created by Margaret Mead developed her mentor Boas's life group displays into more all-encompassing experiential constructions, the balance between distance and immersion that Mead's creation sought to mediate could be seen, as Diane Loesch famously argued, to have disclosed, quote, the contradictory desires built into modernist ethnology 
end quote, the antithetical yearning to both panoptically see over and thereby gain control of an area, while simultaneously attempting to embed the viewer in place and recuperate authentic experience. And even whilst the principal museological paradigm of the last 20 years, the contact zone, attempted to trans transcend Mead's technique of similitude through a mode in which the subjects of the Ethnographic Museum were themselves increasingly able to negotiate the collection and the narration of their own objects, the very discourse of consultation integral to this approach can, in many cases, be seen simply to have bolstered the institution without truly empowering the communities they were collaborating with. So as Robin Boast has argued, it can easily come to form a quote, asymmetric space where the periphery comes to win a small momentary and strategic advantage for where the center ultimately gains, end quote, in which quote, others come to perform for us, not with us and in which a pragmatic agonism is provided for all, but only to the degree in which it returns to and reinforces the academy. So, a very brief pot in history. The practice of curation within the history of anthropology must, in this way, be seen to be integral to both the past disposition and present status of the subject as a whole, a technique through which anthropological norms are formed within a material rather than discursive mode. Curation must therefore be understood not only as a public way of revealing our research, an impactful way of displaying its results, but a mode by which concepts are opened up and paradigms initiated, a practice in which a political and ethical relationship to both our subject and our subjects has and can be instantiated. So that's the starting position. I'm saying that you know, everything we do inside these spaces creates a particular relationship to both the people that we're working with, our interlocutors, our collaborators, our friends, but also creates a way of understanding the discipline of anthropology itself. That was a, a, a missed uh, slide. So curating the cur curatorial. I'm gonna have a sip of coffee. Awful instant coffee. Um, Okay, so in this brief talk, uh, I want to explore a particular technique of curating uh, that I've been undertaking in my own anthropological practice, a method that can function not merely as exhibit, but that encompasses research, output, and impact in one. This framed by the concept of the curatorial as a notion defined in distinction to curating is emerging from critical art practice rather than from museology per se, and one presenting itself as an expanded mode of research rather than exhibitor, exhibitory practice. So developing beyond the form of research typically encountered within exhibitions, however, through research-led curating uh, then, uh, that is simply a precursor uh, to output, this is a mode of research functioning, functioning in a perpetual, not preludial manner. So as such, the curatorial can be seen to involve a half turn away from objects, away at least from their overarching hegemony. So echoing the manner in which artists have questioned the dominance of the artifact within contemporary art itself, something uh, witnessed not only within the field of conceptual art in the 60s, in which the idea and the concept gained dominance over the object, but so too within the fields, more recent fields of post-internet art, relational aesthetics, socially engaged art, in which the object did not become the most important part of the art project, but uh, this turn implicitly places the object as part of a dynamic sequence of events rather than a static moment of idiosyncrasy. That is designating this as a post autonomous position. Nestor Garcia Canclini sees this as a zone in which, quote, art practices based on objects have incre increasingly been displaced in favor of practices based on context, end quote, in which art moves beyond the, quote, autonomy of fields like Bourdieu or Worlds as a Becker, end quote, and is rather understood to be inextricably embedded within social, economic, and political regimes. So the object status as an ultimate element of focus is hence substituted or better reinforced by a practice of close research and site responsive investigation related to conditions, not just spaces. So the material procedures of an exhibition making of exhibition making are here subsumed or augmented by the regimes of discourse and dialogue or experiment and inquiry traditionally placed at the backstage or beforehand. 
The curatorial dust moves beyond the exhibition as a space of uni, uni of uniquo, uniquivocal. I don't think I've ever had to say that word. Uniquivocal utterance or finalized display. That's a quote from O'Neill and Wilson. So it's not about this finalized display. It's about an urge towards a space for ongoing possibilities rather than results, a space to develop questions rather than circumscribed answers, and a site of knowledge production rather than of knowledge presentation. Is that a move, as Eric Rogoff argued, away from illustration, away from exemplification, and towards that which we do not yet know, or that which is not yet a subject in the world? So within the curatorial, we can also develop a particular, detect rather, a particular relationship to time. So whilst the traditional meteorological condition has always necessitated time's arrest, freezing the artifact at its moment of collection, here the curatorial stretches time, exploring, as Victor Buckley has noted, quote, what happens before and after the artifact, exploring, quote, the terms of materiality rather than material culture itself. Johannes Fabian's seminal treatise Time and the Other from 1983 can thus in many ways provide us with an interesting blueprint shifting from the ethnographic to the museological. The curatorial can be seen as a method searching for a way beyond what Fabian famously termed allochronism, beyond a mode that spatially and temporally distances our research, our research subjects or their objects, that relegates our ethnographic partners or their artifacts to a distant time a time other than ours, a time forever still. Whilst the classical museum dynamic can hence be seen to almost exactly replicate what Fabian called the schizogenic use of time, inherent to anthropological discourse, as a space denying any notion of shared temporality, presenting the conditions of knowledge via techniques of detachment, functioning through a ret rhetoric of neutrality, exactly like the museum itself does, a more equitable relation can be only can only ever emerge through an emphasis on process rather than the outcome of a final exhibition. Here we can thus focus on the forces of historical inertia that museums are perhaps inescapably implicated with. That was this quote from Stocking. Through asserting the value of ongoing collaboration and cooperation of simultaneity over staticity. And here, you know, looking at Fabian's work is really important in terms of the dynamics of what he's talking about in narrative term, in genre term of, of anthropology uh, is being is, is something reflected exactly the, in exactly the same ways within the classical museum condition. Okay, the curatorial practice. So whilst I've elsewhere recently discussed my curating in the realm of graffiti, that was for a book um, edited by Roger Sansi Rocker called uh, The Anthropologist as Curator. And that was uh, an essay exploring how uh, one could present an essentially public, essentially ephemeral, performative and inalienable form of artifact or art within the site of the museum. And a practice, this is my earlier uh, cur curating within the graffiti world, which utilised curating broadly as a space to present the research I'd previously undertaken to a wider public, whilst also being able to see uh, provide a space in which my interlocutors could deal with the increasingly anxious relationship between street and institution. Excuse me, so broadly saying, on the one hand, much of that research was like, oh, look, this is what I studied and this is what I learned. Here it is, in a way much more easy to kind of like, you know, accept and 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 uh, reveal itself than in, in an ethnographic monograph. And in the same way, as a way of kind of starting to kind of um, develop the kind of frictions and experience together, the frictions that a lot of my interlocutors felt when working within an institutional space. My most recent project, now three years ago, which is crazy, um, entitled Motions of This Kind, is a project which I argue uh, engages more clearly within the concept of the curatorial. Uh, this is the uh, Roger Sansi Rocker uh, book with a picture of a performance from one of my uh, exhibitions at Somerset House on the front by the fantastic Italian artist, Filippo Manelli. Um, okay, so emerging out of a three year postdoc, uh, British Academy postdoc fellowship, for which I undertook approximately eight months of fieldwork in Metro Manila, the Philippines. The ethnographic focus of my fellowship was on the capital's diverse, highly developed contemporary art scene. So conducting research with artists, gallerists, curators, fabricators, writers, editors, collectors, filmmakers, musicians, producers, 
coders, designers, publishers, and a myriad of other individuals connected to the wider art ecosystem. My fieldwork set out to explore the tension between the lived situation of my research partners in the Philippines and their wider cosmopolitan presence in the global art world via international education, international exhibitions, international residency projects, etc. let alone the familial ties to overseas foreign workers who make up over 10% of the country's population. So principally, it was a relatively recent paradigm of global art that was the wider setting of my project. And my research came to focus on the ways in which my interlocutors everyday practices rubbed up against this new form of art world hegemony. With that said, producing an exhibition related to this new research project was not an aspiration that I took with me to the field, or at least not one that I discussed with my interlocutors. So when I went to the field, I didn't go there as a curator at all. I went there as a researcher. Nevertheless, at the midpoint of the project, I applied to an open call at the School of African and Oriental Studies uh, Brunei Gallery in the hope that it could develop my research further, both temporally and theoretically, a proposal which was put together, uh, which uh, was put together to be successful, uh, which was accepted in June of 2016, just three years in advance of the exhibition. Once the proposal was accepted, the real work of determining the project thus begun. So the proposal, project proposal was exactly not what I wanted to do, but exactly what I thought the site would agree to doing. So it was this uh, like, come see the Philippines. Like it was this very uh, kind of survey show uh, as surveillance, uh, which is kind of the technique uh, which um, most of you know these sites want, right? So first and foremost, so I understood that curating the project by myself, uh, acting as the sole impresario in O'Neill's terms, and this is the kind of come see the Philippines, would be a clearly inappropriate position. So seeking to collaborate with local cultural workers whose lived knowledge would always exceed my own, I thus approached two of my closest interlocutors and friends, the artist curator Merv Espina and the writer curator Renan Laruan. Thankfully, who both agreed to participate me as a team, participate with me as a team, uh, an intense period of planning ensued, both online and in person, in Manila. Renan actually has just become the director of Savvy Contemporary in Berlin, which is super exciting. is one of the most kind of important uh, contemporary galleries in the world. Um, so, uh, what became clear early on? Uh, so, just just to back up a bit. So. You know, the reason I wanted to do the exhibition, I kind of saw my postdoc kind of coming to the end. I was like, well, how can I, you know, I continue this on and how can I find a way of collaborating with my interlocutors rather than just following them around and annoying them the whole time? So what became clear early on was the relationship between where we were working and what we were working on, of course, had to be pivotal. Situated not just in London, but as SOAS had thus become central. So whilst a school today famous for its radical left leanings, SOAS, which is a school of Oriental and African studies, where in fact I did my undergrad, was originally founded as, an, as a quote, instrument to strengthen Britain's political, commercial and military presence in Asia and Africa, end quote, serving to bolster the prolongation of the British Empire through providing, quote, instruction to colonial administrators, commercial managers and military officers, but also to missionaries, doctors and teachers, end quote. Added to the fact that the school had recently initiated a new hub, the Philippines Center, under the guidance of the uh, amazing uh, colleague, Dr. Christina Juan, and had a huge archive of Filipino material which had yet to be explored, including nearly 150 boxes, uh, there we go, uh, of unopened letters, photographs, field notes, and ephemera from the E4 Bao Powell Collective. So I'm pretty sure that Bao Powell was a spy. It's hard to like be certain about it, but what he was really doing in the Philippines and the amount of documentation and archive he brought back, um, it just, it doesn't feel like right to me. Um, but I, that's, yeah, you know, just uh, a hunch. So, um, so you had this amazing archive. So it was the historical and contemporary flows that intertwined and knitted the UK and the Philippines together that we wanted to keep up front and center. Yeah, it was a passage from Sir Isaac Newton's uh, famous Principia in which Luconia was mentioned, uh, known today as Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines, that gave us our concrete starting point. So whilst able to prove, to prove in his Principia, a he was able to prove, prove universal gravitation through calculating the movement of the planets, 
as well as being the first scientist to finally establish the reason for oceanic tides, Newton in Principia was confounded by the currents witnessed by Edmund Halley around the Philippines. Yet these perplexing motions, as Filipino historian Ricardo Manapat suggested, could not only be examined in light of the um, rise and fall of the tides, but so too in the historical ebb and flow of ideas. So the aporia in Newton's understanding thus led us to an exploration of the turbulent temporal currents flowing between Europe and Southeast Asia, the undertows that have come to hasten and delay the circulation of knowledge. As such, placing belatedness as our principal theme, belatedness of ideas, of objects, of bodies, the project aimed to underscore the various propositions and problems that this temporal state or its accusation brings. Your, our, our emphasis saw belatedness as that in which traces of the past could not only come back to haunt the present, but could act following Homi Baba as a tool of resistance, a rupture rejecting the dynamic of primary and secondary. So commissioning a series of new works by 11 artists working either in or on the Philippines. And that was very important that we were commissioning new works as well as featuring an archival display from the never before exhibited uh, Baopal archive. The various, so this is one set of works from Enzo Camacho and Amy Lien that we're seeing. The various works shown in the exhibition took the concept of belatedness as a starting point from which to investigate the relationship between the temporal and the spatial, the colonial and the personal, the historical and the contemporary, the local and the global. So I want to discuss two particular works here by Mark Salvatis and Cien Vai Ritz. Um, I'm just looking at my time. Um, actually, how much time have I got? Because I could not discuss those works and I could just go on to my conclusion or I could quickly discuss them. Um, um, maybe like five to six more minutes so that we have at least 10 minutes for discussion. Okay, cool. So, yeah. um, okay, I'm, I think I'm just going to, because talking about the specific works is really interesting, but I think what's, um, and this is the work by Cian that I was going to talk about, um, which is the, the map of Southeast Asia and Australasia, which has been turned upside down, where North has become South, where East has become West. But where he's also included, where half of it was actually embroidered in the UK and was embroidered um, by an organization called, um, what they called, they were called, um, where is it? I'm looking for it here. I can't find their name, but they um, would have been the people that embroidered the military uniforms that the British Army wore in the Philippines when they were the colonial uh, power for eight or nine months. So a lot, there was a lot, you know, a lot of the, the projects were all produced in collaboration. There was a lot of, um, anyway, ignore that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry on talking. So without talking about the specifics of the, the works, which we can do, and I can give you a link to the Vimeo where you've got videos on each of the works that were produced. So it's a project itself as an open-ended research method that I actually want to reinstate here. <clears throat> the exhibition as a methodological technique, as a space of speculation over just demonstration that I want to reinforce. So as a methodology, the very fact of the exhibi exhibition positioned me within the wider political economy of art in a way that pushed me and my research into previously elusive spaces, so spaces that I wasn't able to encounter undertaken traditional ethnographic methods. So it gave me access to certain members of the wider art ecosystem, so to politicians, to philanthropists, to gallerists. It gave me access to certain professional practices, into aspects of patronage, delegation, cooperation I would otherwise have been excluded from. Moreover, it gave me access to a level of collaborative intensity with my interlocutors that only a joint enterprise could allow. So the days spent in Manila, the weeks spent in Manila with my co-curators working out an initial concept were a period of condensed yet concentrated, accelerated fieldwork that enabled the whole operational structure of a collaborative shared project by the professional rather than observational relationship that was formed. So the fact that we had a professional relationship here that it wasn't just me observing but us actually seeing together how their lives worked how their professional lives worked was massively important here and this of course is without discussing the months in fact years of continuous correspondence and discourse that persisted amongst the entire network of artists curators producers gallerists philanthropists as we pushed forward as a collective over that three years just to get the exhibition point the interpersonal relationships enriched through the mechanism of the wider project and the heightened resonance of the collective exhibition project itself. So it was something important we were working towards together. 
So rather than simply following my research partners as they went about their everyday lives, here we were thinking about concepts together. Without the grounding of the wider enterprise, however, none of this would really be possible. The time I decided I desired to spend with them would inevitably have been an imposition, not a collaboration, a demand I would be unwilling to make and they, more to the point, almost certainly unwilling to accept. As methodology then, the curatorial enabled me to impel my work upwards towards people I would otherwise have been able, unable to reach, as well as to burrow it deeper towards those who would otherwise be able to unafford that necessary time to conduct in George Marcus's famous words, ethnography all the way up and down. It gave me insights into the many of the ways that both the local and global art world actually functioned, whilst also creating its own call and response, leading to ever more opportunities and engagements. So I'm gonna miss out a little bit about um, all the kind of webs that it led to within kind of this global art network between London, Manila, uh, Venice, etc. So now, of course, many anthropologists today, um, including many of those uh, within our department, have sought to face the challenges at the root of the museum as a site of innovative, uh, as a site in innovative and powerful ways. In the shift from curating to the curatorial, however, the anthropologist comes to move from being a custodian of artifacts to simultaneously a co-producer, a critic or an agent provocateur. A role in which the aim is not merely to explain the other, but to work alongside them to destabilize the relationship of power that the museum normally embeds. So these are projects in which knowledge is generated, not simply reproduced, in which exhibitions become, as Bassi and McDonald have said, excuse me, not simply a medium for representation, but a medium for enactment. Here we can speak alongside our interlocutors, facilitating, not controlling their ways of seeing. We can create knowledge, new knowledge, rather than display already confirmed truth. We can think about all knowledge as co-creation, as co-production, a space in which ethnography stretches far beyond the space and time of the preparatory alone. So as method the curatorial can enable a level of access and in temporal engagements we would otherwise be denied, while simultaneously elevating the entire process to a space of active research. As method, it can eschew the dominance of the autonomous artifact and instead focus on the potential for collaborative uh, and collective practice. This does not mean, of course, that objects are abandoned, but as the Bruno Latour has shown, they become part of a performative turn in which aesthetic product is replaced by an artistic practice that can be object-based or object-free that expands the scope of enactment. As method, the curatorial can act as a site of the speculative, the subjunctive, as a field of evolution rather than exposition. So we can explore works that provide, as Gus uh, uh, Canclini has said, not doctrinaire answers or programs, not propositions or conclusions, but enable us to experience the pathways and enigmas of knowledge. So as method, the anthropologist can become an organizer rather than the omnipotent controller of ideas. Artworks such as my interlocutors are forming here can thus in themselves be seen as ethnographic objects, as facts in themselves, as valuable material works functioning on an equivalent level at the least to our own ethnographic practice. As what Hans-Jörg Weinberger has called epistemic objects an approach stressing the materiality of the research process, as well as their capacity to surprise the researcher, to defeat his or her expectations, this is all a quote, to dwarf his or her powers of anticipation with their own revelatory richness, end quote. So rather than just telling other people's stories badly, as Michael Tausick has famously said, turning stories into scientific observations through separating out aesthetics and facts, these artistic narratives, these artistic stories, objects, practices must be seen as a form bringing material, data, beliefs and theories to life. So curatorial methodology thus moves beyond the idea of the exhibition as a space of impact alone, which of course is important and the impact of this exhibition was very important to me, but rather sees it as a space in which research, output and impact are in constant and mutual relationship in which projects act as platforms for investigation, as sites of exposure, as nexuses for access. Rather than presenting our own theories, the relationship to our partners, our research partners becomes primary, the ethical commitment to those who we're collaborating with. The curatorial methodology must therefore be seen as a practice holding huge potential for the anthropological project in more general, not merely a mode of best practice for the museum, but one in which the relationship to our subjects and their objects can be reassessed 
and one in which the political framing of anthropology and ethnography as practice and corpus can be reformed and reactivated itself. So just as a very quick aside, because that is actually the conclusion, it was times in which uh, my co-curator was enjoying how painful it was for me to organise the visas for all the artists, right? Where my British passport finally meant nothing. And the trauma of organising the visas was something that clearly he loved me being traumatised over. Uh, it was the way that artists who were actual, um, you know, activists who were working um, you know, literally doing field work uh, on um, land rights, the way they had to deal with collectors, right? The way they had to navigate philanthropists uh, who were landowners while simultaneously being activists working on land reform. Um, it was the way uh, my home became residency space, right? So it was the way that artists would spend all day in the archive and then would tell me about the fact they were just going to go to bed because in the morning after their dreams, everything would make sense, right? So a totally different way of thinking about research and data that I would think about. Um, it was about, this is being recorded, but it's fine. It was about the philanthropists that owned the internet in the Philippines and the artwork and art exhibition, exhibition which was squashing the Wi-Fi at the service gallery to one megabyte per second. So as his videos would constantly crash and constantly buffer, because that's the speed of the internet as it is out there. Um, it was the Skype, the hours spent on Skype, the hours spent on WhatsApp. It was reciprocity and access to funding. Um, so it was all these things together that the exhibition was about. That was just one moment of three months when it was open. And, you know, the, using this methodology and thinking about the exhibition exhibition in this way is not just output, it's not just impact, but as research output and impact altogether, um, really enabled me to kind of burrow down and push up in ways otherwise I could never have imagined. Okay, I'll finish there. So thank you very much.